Today's story comes from Luke 16, 19 through 31. There once was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus. He was covered with sores and longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the, finger of his, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. But Abram replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abram said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. And this is one that it's hard to say, thanks be to God, after. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, as we approach this kind of confusing little story that you told your followers, we struggle with, with what we see here, with the answer to the question of what would Jesus do, and then the second question of what then would Jesus have us do. Open our ears and soften our hearts so that we can hear the truth in even these words. Amen. What would Jesus do? That is a hard one to answer with today's text, because the answer taken at face value is that Jesus, God, will in the next life reward those who had a hard time in this life and punish those who are comfy who are wealthy. Taken at face value, I can be done with my sermon. Which is pretty impressive, me being done with the sermon in under five minutes, but you are not so lucky today. I am sorry. When we approach this story, when we approach all the parables, all the teachings of Jesus, it is important to ask not just the what would Jesus do question, but also the what would Jesus have me do, have us do question. This is the question that Jesus intends us all to ask after really tough teachings like this one. And it is often communicated by our gospel writers with him saying at the end of a parable or a teaching these words, let those who have ears hear. This is a phrase that often comes at the end of a string of parables, and building off of this, uh, one biblical scholar explains that a parable is not a prediction. This parable is not a prediction. 
It is an invitation to rewrite the ending. A parable is not a prediction. It is an invitation to think, to reckon, to consider ourselves. It is an invitation to rewrite the ending. So we have a task at hand. And if we are going to rewrite the ending of this parable, let us start at the beginning. Right off the bat, in this story, we are introduced to the antagonist. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Without any further information, we know that he is the antagonist, the villain, from this single line. This description of the rich man is one of ostentatious wealth. And generally speaking, throughout the Gospels, wealth like this comes under strict scrutiny, dare I say, condemnation from Jesus. First century audience would know that this man was not just wealthy, but really, really wealthy because he wore purple. Purple cloth was extremely expensive, and this guy chose to wear it every single day. He was choosing to let everyone in every circle of his life know that he had money every day. Scholars point out that every day would include the Sabbath, and that it seems as though he dressed when he dressed like this and he held banquets means that maybe he didn't attend synagogue. He didn't go to worship on Sunday. To Jesus' first century listeners, this would be a pretty clear demonstration to them that this man is a man who breaks the first of the great commandments, which is to love God. And then in the next verse, we find out that he breaks the second commandment, to love his neighbor as himself. This rich man's neighbor is Lazarus. Lazarus is the only protagonist or main character in all of Jesus' parables to be given a name by Jesus. Jesus goes on to describe Lazarus as incredibly poor, drawing a stark contrast between the two characters. One, the rich man, is dressed in purple, and the other, the poor man, Lazarus, is dressed in sores. Whether his sores are the cause or the effect of his poverty is not made clear in the text, but Jesus chooses to link these two together. Jesus pairs together financial well-being and physical well-being. Today, the American Academy of Family Physicians links these two together, financial and physical well-being, and also expands on that, expands on how poverty also affects things like mental health and life expectancy. A New Testament scholar, Ken Bailey, touches on the fact that Lazarus' mental health is a part of this story, suggesting that Lazarus' deepest suffering wasn't just physical, it was psychic. He writes, traditional Middle Eastern villages are geographically tightly compacted. The gate at which Lazarus lay was certainly within earshot of the daily sumptuous banquets of that rich man. Only a few feet from Lazarus was a group of overfed men reclined each day while really hungry and in pain, he had to listen to their conversation. And those same men, says Bailey, passed by him every day as they entered and left the rich man's house. So I was thinking about this scene as I was painting that out in my head. Couldn't help but think, how did the rich man, how did these rich men do it? How did they walk past this man every day to attend these parties and brunches and feasts? And then I realized that maybe they were able to do it 
because they had become desensitized. And maybe they were able to do it because maybe some of them had compassion fatigue. Jesus tells us elsewhere that the poor are always going to be in our midst. They're always present. And we know that there are so many. It is hard to know what to do for someone like Lazarus, who has so many financial, physical, mental, and emotional needs. To survive in a world where we are surrounded by this much pain, one way we cope is by detaching. Maybe this is what the rich man and his friends did. They drew a line. They built a fence. They installed a gate. Maybe they separated themselves from Lazarus because they were disgusted, or maybe they separated themselves from him because assisting with his problems felt too hard from them, demanded too much of them. Now, I am a big advocate of healthy boundaries. Having compassion is hard. It literally means to suffer alongside of another person. And if there was ever a pro at that, at suffering alongside, it was Jesus. And Jesus himself was a big fan of healthy boundaries. To sustain his ministry of compassion, of coming alongside and suffering alongside humanity, he would go off all the time without his disciples to pray and to rest. But there is a big difference between going off to rest so that you can continue a ministry of compassion and cutting off the people that God has placed at your gate completely. Separating yourself so you don't have to deal with suffering, so that you don't have to work through the things that God has called you to reckon with. And that is close to what the rich man did. He separated himself, literally, from Lazarus. I often wonder how long it went on like this, how long Lazarus was brought to the rich man's gate, and how long folks walked right past him. Eventually, they both die and enter into the afterlife. There, the rich man finds that just as they were separated in life, so also they have been separated in death. This time, however, the rich man is the one outside the gate, and Lazarus is at Abraham's side feasting. Abraham, as in Father Abraham. And Abraham, in conversation with the rich man, makes it clear to him that the division, the divide between the rich man and Lazarus, is something that the rich man established in life. And thus, it would remain in death. And that, in fact, that divide, that gap in death, had become uncrossable. The rich man tries to get around this a couple of different ways. Most specifically, by asking Abraham to have Lazarus do a few things for him. He asks him to have Lazarus bring him water. He asks him to have Lazarus go back to his family and warn them. And while the second one might seem like a shift in the rich man's thinking, at least he's not just thinking about himself, right? We see that once again, actually, the rich man seems incapable of addressing Lazarus. His request does not put Lazarus on an equal playing field with him, but implies that Lazarus is still subservient to him and his family. Father Abraham will have none of it. Abraham will not have Lazarus care for or cater to the needs of the very people who denied him financial, physical, or emotional help when he needed it most. Abraham will not have Lazarus care for or cater to the needs of the people who denied him. In some ways, this is shocking, really shocking. We associate the teachings of Jesus with being incredibly compassionate, calling always for forgiveness and reconciliation. 
And we think of that often as servant leadership, of putting our own needs after the needs of others. And so we think, wouldn't the what would Jesus do question for Lazarus be answered by offering the rich man that water? Or at least be resurrected and return to that rich man's family and tell them the good news. For isn't that what Jesus would do? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Offer folks water, raise his friend Lazarus from the grave, and eventually raise from the dead himself. While these things may be true of Jesus, these things are apparently not true of Jesus' plan for the character of Lazarus. It seems as though Jesus is teaching another set of lessons today, and it starts with this. Jesus is teaching that there is sometimes a difference in what Jesus does and what Jesus would have us do. Jesus is teaching us that those who are victimized are not always in a place to care for those who have hurt them. It is part of the great commandment that we often forget to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Through Abraham's protection of Lazarus, Jesus is showing that it is not necessarily okay to put the responsibility for change and reconciliation and forgiveness on those who have been hurt. As the writer of Ecclesiastes explains, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under the sun, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. But like the rich man, we so badly want the ones we have hurt to be the ones who heal us because we don't have then to reckon with the guilt or the shame. And don't get me wrong, Jesus is ready and willing to wash away the guilt and the shame, but he is also interested in us having to reckon with what's going on and to learn. Speaking of reckoning and learning, when listening to this story, it's interesting how quickly we go to what Lazarus did. We start to track with the character of Lazarus, and we look to him for what we should be doing. I don't know that that's what Jesus is inviting us to do here. In the way that Jesus tells this story, he leaves the rich man's name out and puts in Lazarus' name. By including Lazarus' name, he helps us build up our compassion for Lazarus as a character, but it also should make us harder to insert ourselves in Lazarus' place. Similarly, leaving out the rich man's name is a good way to get listeners to insert their name in his place. And yet, because he is the antagonist in the story, we struggle to put ourselves into that role. It is not unlike, the, unlike David and the prophet Nathan, when the prophet Nathan had to explicitly say to David, no, David, you are the rich man in this story. Like Nathan, the whole point of Jesus telling this parable is so that his listeners can learn from the rich man's mistakes can rewrite the ending of their own stories, and to warn us against the parallels of becoming desensitized to the pain of those right outside our gates. And as I was jumbling through these characters and the richness of this story this week, this story, this idea, this call to learn really hit home. As reports of the Atlanta shootings rolled in, and as the frenzy of conversation really picked up on social media and in the news, and arguments broke out about whether the shooting in Atlanta was motivated by racism or sexism or mental health or evangelical Christian purity codes, I have to admit I started to feel frustration, desperation, and a hint of compassion fatigue or desensitization creeping in. I am not a part of the individual families or wider communities that are actively experiencing physical and emotional toll of the shootings, the ones that are making the headlines. 
but as a sibling in Christ, a fellow human being made in the image of God, I know that I am responsible to have compassion for those who are scared and grieving. I am responsible to understand my responsibility in this circumstance. And yet, even though I know all of that to be true, I found myself feeling and thinking, do we really have to have this conversation again? I am tired. It's the same sort of feeling that can happen in lots of circumstances. It can happen when we see the COVID case numbers, or the cancer statistics, or the domestic violence numbers, or the abortion rates, or the wealth gap. Maybe we try to address these issues that the stats report to us for a time, but then but then we can get really frustrated when our conversations always seem to devolve into something that smells of partisan politics instead of bringing about the effective change that we had hoped for. And personally, I've gotten tired. Tired of having those conversations. And so in a way that resembles the way that we pass by a person on the street corner, I found myself wanting to avert my eyes, to close off my hearts, to put on a robe, to bake a quiche and host a brunch and ignore the conversations at my gate. But then there was this text, this story, through which Jesus shows his followers that the gaps, divides, chasms created in this life might extend to the next. This story through which Jesus asks his followers not to see this as a prediction, but as an invitation to rewrite the ending. And so here we are, looking for a way to rewrite the ending. Frustratingly, albeit typical of a parable, typical of Jesus, Jesus does not clearly outline how the ending of this story or our stories can be rewritten. The only thing that is clear is that the rewriting shouldn't wait until death, but should start now, in this lifetime, with the people, with the issues that are right outside our gates with the very things that we would prefer to wall off, to divide ourselves from the things we do not want to reckon with. That is where it starts. I actually think this lack of a plan is really helpful. It reminds us that we do not need to solve all these problems overnight. We just need to start. While we don't get a clear outline from Jesus, I do think we get a clue as the starting point which is with the who, and, and how to go about taking baby steps towards proceeding. Unlike any of his other parables, Jesus chooses to name the protagonist in today's story, Lazarus. Saying his name Giving him a name helps us grow in compassion for him. What if the rich man in today's story had known and addressed his neighbor, Lazarus, by name? Or if he did know his name, what if he knew his story? Maybe then this parable would have a different ending. And I think about that in the context of this week's news. What if the shooter had known each of the names and the lives and the life stories of the folks that he killed? Maybe the ending of that story would have changed. Maybe saying and writing and knowing names and stories is how we are invited into the work of rewriting the end of this parable. So let those who have ears hear the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The parable of the rich man and Soon Chung Park, of Hyun Chan Grant, of Soon Cha Kim, of Young A. Yu, 
of Delania Ashley Young, of Paul Andre Michaels, of Xiaoji Tan, of Dao Yu Feng. Let those who have ears hear the parable of the rich person and the person right outside your gate. Amen.